Sakuna of Rice and Ruin is a side-scrolling action platformer mixed with farm simulation style gameplay and wrapped in a blanket of Japanese mythology. It certainly turned a few heads when its trailer was shown at 2019's E3 and it's about to release on the Nintendo Switch. Mark and I have collaborated with this review, the first review collab we've done in quite a while. Is the decision to pick this one up rice and easy or does it go against the grain? I'm Glenn Bolger, thank you to the publishing team for the review codes and now let's find out. The game begins with a small group of humans having crept into the lofty realm. After a while they meet Sakuna, daughter of the warrior god and the harvest goddess. She is in all honesty a bit of a brat who has grown up accustomed to getting her own way. After following the humans she finds them eating the rice that she was going to offer to Kamahitsuki, the divine goddess, at this year's festival and attempts to stop this inadvertently starting a fire in the process. Kamahitsuki says that whilst they wait for a gateway to send the humans home and as punishment for their actions, Sakuna and the humans must locate to the land of the demons and vanquish the threat there. It's a story of accepting responsibility, looking after those you swore to protect and the never ending journey towards self improvement. This leads into the gameplay and it's actually quite an interesting mix of action platforming, slash em up combat and farm simulator. On arriving at the island you will station yourselves at the old home of Sakuna's mother. This will act as a hub area in some respects and this is where the farming takes place. Leaving this farm area takes you to a world map and from here you must select an area to travel to to fight the demons. Only one area will be available to begin with but more will open up as you play. Fighting the demons is where the side scrolling part of the game takes place and defeating the enemies will see you gather food resources such as meat and you can also find extra resources including ore, wood and stone. Each area has a set number of objectives such as defeating a particular number of enemies, finding a certain item hidden within the area or gathering a specific resource. Clearing these objectives will increase your exploration rate for that area and by improving this rating your overall exploration level will go up and further areas will open up for you to explore. If you die within one of these areas you will start from the screen that you progress to but lose any resources that you gathered. You can leave an area at any time saving those resources by going to the menu screen and pressing X and it would be wise at these points to then return back to the farm as resting here will restore your health. Let's talk a bit about the farm at this point. The human characters are stationed here and they will offer some assistance to you when you return. Mirte will cook any of the ingredients that you find giving you a stat boost in battle but also keeping your fullness rating high. If this drops you will not be able to restart an area should you die so it's important to eat quite often. The problem is that the resources you find are perishable and will spoil with the passing of time. Time passes when you do things such as rest or just generally passes as you play and you'll watch the seasons go by. After a while though you will have the option to process or preserve foods negating the issue of them perishing but you must remember to visit Mirte and give her the food in order for her to preserve them. Taoimon will give you advice on how to produce crops or just one crop in particular and that is rice. In fact it's not so much a farm sim as I said earlier as it is a rice sim as odd as that might sound. You will carry out the agricultural process of growing the rice in painstaking detail. Growing this rice you see plays a big part of the game as it is ultimately the rice you grow that gives Sakuna her strength. When spring comes around you will need to till the earth, plant the seeds and then keep an eye on them between visiting areas to battle demons. These sections of the game are played out in 3D as you can see and you must pick up any creatures that might eat your crops, pull any weeds up that occupy their space and ensure they get the correct amount of water by opening and closing the water gates whilst being mindful of how the downpours of rain may also affect this water level. Taoimon will tell you when they are ready to harvest and you must then thresh them and hold them to produce the rice. This is a lengthy process and takes place across the course of the seasons. Between this you will be battling and gathering more resources but once you have produced the rice you will receive a boost to your base stats making Sakuna stronger in battle and the stats you receive will correlate to the quality of the rice you grew. It's an interesting system and whilst the idea of harvesting and battling has been done before, in the Rune Factory games for example, I don't think I've ever seen them so intrinsically linked as they are here. In Rune Factory for example, you can favour one over the other but here the crops must be good to make you stronger to battle so both must be given your attention. You even have to create fertiliser to put on your crops and you can add any of the foods that have been spoiled to this to enhance its nutritional value to your crops. It really helps to make you feel that anything you collect whilst out battling the enemies is useful and again forges a unique relationship between you and the two playstyles. 
The farming duties themselves are all carried out via a series of mini-games for want of a better phrase, and as you partake in these, Sakuna's proficiency in each of these areas will increase, rather than this just equating to an increase in your stats or an automatic bump in the quality of your crops, the rewards come in the form of passive abilities. So for example, improving at seeding the rice will earn you a grid overlay that shows you roughly how far apart the crops should be placed, meaning you literally can get better at the task as the game starts to assist you a bit more. It helps to create the feeling of strife and toil to begin with, to highlight Sakuna's mindset at that time in regards to the new lifestyle she's had put upon her. With the gradual drip feeding of the assist simulating the quest for perfection that Sakuna strives towards as her skills improve and her mindset changes. I liked this model, it allowed you to empathise with Sakuna as a character a bit more. It doesn't always translate over perfectly to a video game, with some of the controls feeling very awkward within these sections, the seeding and tilling parts in particular feeling quite unwieldy. Back to the battling sections then, and as with the farming you will also unlock fighting skills. These work slightly differently to the farming skills in that they aren't passive and must instead be selected from within your menu and assigned to Sakuna. As well as this, she has an interesting grapple move via her celestial scarf performed with a press of the R button. This will assist you with reaching higher platforms but can also be used in combat with you able to latch onto enemies and propel yourself past them to avoid them or even propel them towards you as you begin to unlock new abilities for it. The controls in combat feel smooth and air more towards timing based combat than pure speed. This slightly slower element to the combat coupled with a slower walking speed for Sakuna does take some getting used to and I must admit I would have preferred the speed to have been dialed up a notch but I did warm to it as the hours went by. Certain areas will contain boss characters and beating these will unlock new areas. These boss battles were incredibly enjoyable, you could get absolutely battered on your first attempt, try again straight after and destroy them and the reason for this is because a lot of the time it was about how you used your abilities rather than having to go and upgrade a weapon. You will revisit areas often as you look to complete objectives and increase your exploration level, although you do unlock the ability to fast travel to certain places later meaning you can get straight to the depths of an area after returning home and healing. Some people may find this rinse repeat style of gameplay a tad repetitive, although I would argue that enough is added in regular intervals to prevent tedium from setting in. Another big use for all of the monster parts you will acquire as you defeat the various enemies is that a couple of the human characters will offer to assist you by crafting weapons or new garments for you should you build them the requisite workshops. In terms of negatives, it's not a game that makes all of its mechanics abundantly clear from the start. Some is drip fed in which is absolutely fine but some of it is also buried away until you stumble across it. Some of the cutscenes are a bit too long, such as the dinner scene, which cannot always be skipped straight away, plus the enemy AI is not always the smartest. Gameplay is unique and very rewarding. You really do feel the toil of Sakuna on her journey of self-improvement and redemption. It gets 18 out of 20. Controls are fine for the most part, there were a couple of minor annoyances, and certain aspects of the farming side do feel like they could have been refined a little bit, but overall they score 17 out of 20. Cheers Glenn. Right, let's look at the visuals and performance. It's set on Hino Island, which is filled with forests, rivers and a large volcano. And as such, the visuals and environments reflect this. I want to start though with the character design itself. And this is some of the best I think either Glenn or myself have seen in quite a while. And there are many small details like the flowing garments of your main character and a really impressive lighting system, which allows the player and other objects to cast dynamic shadows. As there is a day night cycle, the game makes particularly good use of shadowing and soft shadowing cast by the player. There are a number of different weather effects including torrential downpours and the snows of winter. And small details like being able to increase the amount of water in your rice field are visually represented in such a way that you can judge the level of water simply by eye, which wouldn't have been possible if they hadn't have gone to these lengths. Animations across the board are decent and in particular your combat and grappling moves felt a little bit like Smash Brothers and a little known game that Glenn suggested called Muramasa the demon blade and I can certainly see where he's coming from. One area where perhaps the game isn't quite as fleshed out is its variety of enemies. As far as performance goes it is excellent. It runs for the most part in the 2.5D sections at 60 frames per second However, unlike so many games before it, if it can't handle 60 FPS, it will simply shift to a locked out 30 FPS, maintaining what feels like a very smooth experience. 
rather than allowing a dynamic frame rate that can cause a very unpleasant experience for the user. In the fully 3D sections, it locks out to 30 and maintains that. I think these are much more intensive graphically speaking, particularly when you consider that dynamic weather and lighting system. There is a day-night cycle here and it's intrinsic to the gameplay. In handheld, the game looks just as good. It's nice and crisp and runs at a fluid 30 or 60 frames per second. Menus are clear and easy enough to read, and compared to some of the recent games Glenn and I have reviewed, this is how it should be done. When you consider this comes essentially from just two people, who were then joined by the artist Ryota Muriyama-san and composer Hiroki Oshima-san, and they've achieved what most big budget studios have failed to do on Switch, and its soundtrack features 42 beautifully created original songs. that have a very traditional Japanese flavour to them, but with quite a quirky, upbeat twang. There is a touch of musical repetition in some of the locales, but they were well composed, and I ended up just humming along with them. The icing on the cake for the audio are the voice actors, where we have to give particular credit to Sakuna, who herself is voiced by the excellent Laura Post, known for her role in Persona 5 Royale. Just consider how ridiculous it would be for a harvest goddess to plant the very rice she receives as an offering. She is charming, cheeky, and quite captivating, and she tends to steal the show in any of the cutscenes she appears in. This is most evident right from the get-go, where she staggers onto camera half drunk, and there are many well-written lines of dialogue which will have you chuckling away. Overall then, visuals and performance are excellent. They score 18 out of 20. And likewise, music and audio is excellent, bar the occasional overly short musical loop. Audio scores 18 out of 20. Sakuna of Rice and Ruin costs £34.99, $39 or €39.99, or $54 Australian dollars 95. It will take up 6.3 gigabytes of your system storage. For this price, you get a lengthy experience with a unique twist, bringing two different gameplay genres together in a way I've never seen before. You won't be spending hours on the farm, growing an assortment of crops, or raising animals as you do in Story of Seasons or Stardew Valley. What you will be doing though, is battling with satisfying combat, managing your time to ensure your crops grow strong, getting stronger in turn, and battling stronger enemies. It's a very engaging loop, and it's all done to a beautiful art style, with the abundance of cutscenes and character development showcasing production values that are at a premium. There is a physical version of the game available, and so far I've seen it about on par with the eShop price, but this of course is another option available to you. Value gets 17 out of 20. To conclude, Sakuna of Rice and Ruin is one of the most unique hybrids I've played in quite a while. With a 2D action platforming side that is incredibly reminiscent of a favourite game of mine, Muramasa the Demon Blade, a fantastic timing based hack and slash style combat, and a farming system that takes just one element of your usual farm life sims, the growing of one particular crop, and really elaborates on it, and then manages to intrinsically link it to the combat so that both parts feel as important as one another. It's not perfect, some parts are a little awkward, and the pacing does suffer at times due to the juxtaposition between the two styles, but it hits much more than it misses, and we wholeheartedly recommend it. Sakuna of Rice and Ruin gets a switch up score of 88%. Thank you everybody for watching this review, I hope you enjoyed it, please do remember to leave a like if you did. Thank you to Mark for contributing to the visual and audio section, very much appreciated. It was nice to do a review together, it's been quite a while since the last one. A quick thank you to our Patreons as always for your continued support, and to each and every one of you for watching our videos. Take care, stay safe, and until next time, happy gaming.